Hello AP Physics 1 students. This is the second video on an object rolling without slipping down an inclined plane. So it's meant to be watched after the previous one. So let's see that. Okay, so we're going to again be looking at an object rolling down an inclined plane from a different approach. So we're going to start over and see if we can get to the same results. And so in your notes, I want you to completely redraw this diagram. I know you're saying that's a bit of a pain, but and I get it, but trust me, it's going to be worth it. So really quickly, just go ahead and draw that same inclined plane angle to angle theta away from the horizontal. Here's our large rolling object. Draw it nice and large, exaggerate if you need to. And it's going to start from initial height h naught. Okay, and I'm going to tell you it's a disk so we can compare it to the same results we got for the previous one. And we'll start it again from rest. Once again, of course, you're going to start with a good free body diagram and it should be look identical to what we did before. Making sure, as always, that you're very careful to draw where the forces are acting. So just like before, we've got the force of gravity pointing straight down acting from the pivot point, in this case, the center of the object. Normal force coming from the surface. You got to draw it from there, going up through the pivot point, perpendicular to the incline. And of course, we got a friction force here, also at that connection point between the object and the inclined plane, obviously opposing motion. Okay, so instead of a torque approach, we're going to take this from an energy approach. And while we would normally draw the uh, write down the entire statement, let's see if we can fast forward just a little bit. Let's first now just evaluate all these different forces to see whether they are conservative, yes or no, and whether they're doing any work. So we have to determine if there's any work done by non-conservative forces. Let's start with the force of gravity. Conservative, yes or no? Of course it's conservative. It's one of our prime examples of a conservative force. No worries there. All right, how about normal force? Conservative, yes or no? No. But I hope you know what's coming next, right? Because we do this all the time. But the object is coming down the incline, and the normal force is always pointing perpendicular to the incline. And so what angles there between the normal force and the direction of motion? 90 degrees. And in W equals F delta X cosine theta, the theta is 90 degrees, which means how much work is the normal force doing? Zero joules. OJ. Okay, so we don't have to worry about it. Fantastic. All right. How about the force of friction? Conservative, yes or no? No. It's definitely a non-conservative force. Ah, so it sounds like we're going to have to about some work done by non-conservative forces, right? Right? Well, wait a second. Let's remind ourselves, this object is not just sliding down the inclined plane, and it's not just rolling down the inclined plane, it's rolling without slipping, because I said so, right? And so if it's rolling without slipping, that means that at every moment that's rolling down the inclined plane, this point of contact is not slipping. It's not moving. What kind of friction force are we talking about here? Yeah, strangely enough, it is a static friction force. Even though the whole object is moving down the inclined plane, at any given moment, that one point of contact is not moving. It's being held in place. And so if you were to try to calculate the work done by the static friction force, W equals F delta X cosine theta, how much delta X is associated with this point that's not moving? Zero. Right? And so strangely enough, like we've seen before, the static friction does no work. So it's weird, right? We have a non-conservative force, but it's not actually doing anything. It's not changing the energy of the system. Weird, right? Okay, but that's what happens anytime we're dealing with rolling without slipping. Okay, so that means we don't have to worry about W and C. And so on the left-hand side of our energy statement, well, I'm starting it from rest. So the translational kinetic energy is going to be zero. And of course, the rotational kinetic energy is going to be zero. So we don't have to worry about anything else. So what sort of energy does it have? Well, obviously it's changing height. So let's establish a zero point for height. And since we've already established H naught as measured from you know, all the way here, let's just call the lowest point, the final height, the zero. And so we'll just say the system only starts with gravitational potential energy between the object and the Earth. Okay, And then when it gets down here to the bottom, obviously there'll be no gravitational potential energy because we're calling this final height zero. And it is moving in a translational sense, and it's rolling. And so this is what our statement should look like. The system starts with only gravitational potential energy, and it's going to end with a mixture of translational kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. We can go ahead now and substitute our equations in, where we're going to be, again, using capital M for the mass of the object, and capital R will be the radius of the object. So here's our MGH naught, translational, one half MVF squared, rotational, mm -hmm, one half I omega squared, omega F squared, right? Anytime if you're confused, just think about, oh, what's the old version of kinetic energy? And then just replace each term with its new rotational equivalent. Mass becomes moment of inertia. Translational speed becomes rotational speed, one half I omega squared. 
All right, now, uh, we have to replace i, and it is a disk, where, again, you can just look it up on the chart. This may be one of the ones you have memorized. We know it's going to be 1 half mr squared. We also want to remember, if it's rolling without slipping, we have this condition that, oh, yeah, that's right. The velocity of the center of mass only for the condition of rolling without slipping is equal to r times the angular speed. And so we can rearrange this as omega final equals vf over r, or v equals r omega. And we can substitute this in here by squaring both of these terms. That's what this looks like. So i becomes 1 half mr squared. Omega final squared becomes vf squared over r squared by just squaring both of these terms. Right? And now, hmm, how can we simplify? Ah, yeah, there's a mass in each term. That's going to go away. And look at this. The r squareds go away as well. So this is going to be independent of the mass of the object and independent of the size of the object. Let's cross all those off. And then rewrite our statement. So gh naught equals 1 half vf squared. This is one half of one half. Be careful with that. So it's one fourth VF squared, all right? And then our goal is to solve for VF. So go ahead and do the algebra here, solving for VF. Okay, shouldn't be really difficult, right? This one half plus one quarter makes three quarters, and then just move it all over, and we should be getting this. Yes, square root of four thirds GH naught. Yeah? Huh? Oh, hey, hey, isn't that exactly what we got? We did the Torx approach. Fantastic, we know things are going well. Okay, let's just finish this up by also finding the acceleration of this object coming down the incline. So what can we use? Well, again, let's use the time-independent kinematics equation, rearranged in this case for acceleration, as we've done so many times before. So vf squared minus v naught squared over twice delta x, where v naught is going to be zero, because I said so, and vf squared, we just square this term here. Now remember, delta x, that's the length of the incline, definitely not the same thing as the starting height. But we'll just play the same trick we did before by relating it to with sine of theta. So I want you to pause the video here and put it all together and see if you can develop the equation for acceleration and see if you can get it to be the same as what we got from our Torx approach. Okay, so just again to remind you, sine theta is h naught over delta x, opposite over hypotenuse. We arrange that for delta x is h naught over sine theta. It's going to go in the denominator. We're going to square this term. It's going to go in for vf squared. So we have 4 thirds to h naught on top, 2 times this, h naught over sine theta, which will flip over. What's going to happen to h naught? It goes away. 2 is going to cancel with you know, 2 times 2 on the top, 1 factor of 2. And we should end up with 2 thirds g sine theta. Would you look at that? Okay, so we got the exact same answers from a completely different approach. And you guys say to yourself, okay, which do I like better, the Torx approach or the energy approach? Well, it doesn't really matter. Just choose whichever works better for you. I find a lot of students tend to like the energy approach better. It seems to be a little bit quicker and, you know, it seems to follow pretty easily. Whereas with the Torx approach, nothing wrong with it, but you do have to do the sigma f equals ma statement and the sigma tau equals i alpha statement. All right, maybe a little bit more work, but some students like that. Maybe it's a little bit more of a, a brute force kind of approach, but they're kind of used to that from other uh, problems with forces and free body diagrams and torques. And so you get to choose whichever one you like best. It doesn't matter. You're going to get the same answer regardless.